Hey, hey everyone. everyone! We're Nick and Rachel. If you're new here and haven't been following our adventures over the past year, you'll typically find us vlogging our travels around the world. But today's video is going to be a little bit different. As we travel through various different countries, we've noticed that some things are a little bit different than what we're accustomed to back home in Canada and the UK. The reason that we have this channel is to share our experiences in the hopes of inspiring others to travel more. With that, we wanted to share with you some tips and tricks for each of the countries that we have visited over the past year so that if you were to go to the same countries, you would be armed to the teeth with useful information. That will help with your research prior to you going to those countries. Today's video is going to focus on traveling around Australia. <laughs> If you've been watching our videos, you'll know that we went to Sydney, Airlie Beach and the Whit Sundays, Cairns and the Great Barrier Reef, Alice Springs and Uluru, we drove the Great Ocean Road, spent some time in Melbourne, and also drove ourselves around Tasmania. While some of the pointers are specific to those places in particular, some of the tips and tricks are going to focus on the country as a whole. We hope that you find them all useful. In order to get into Australia, in most instances, you are going to need to get a visa. However, depending on the type of passport that you have from which country, the type of visa that you're able to have and therefore the conditions of that visa for your stay and how much you may need to pay up front for it may be a little bit different from country to country. In our case, because we are both British citizens, then we were able to actually find a visa that allowed us to go into Australia for 30 days, absolutely free. In a lot of other instances, there will be other visas where you do have to pay an application fee in order to get in. Therefore, it is very much worth making sure that you check beforehand, especially prior to you even booking flights, because you don't want to get caught out. As I'm sure most of you know, so I'm not sure whether this needs to be stated or not, Australia has all of the Western amenities that we're used to, as you would find in North America and Europe. We're not saying that Australia is the exact same as North America or Europe by that statement. We're just pointing out that in terms of grocery stores, cafes, restaurants, bars, road conditions, hotels, booking and going on tours, how you pay for things, drinking water, any kind of amenity or comfort that you can imagine, it's like being at home, and this includes in the rural areas. If you've done some research about Australia, then hopefully it goes without saying that the size of Australia is so much bigger than anybody could possibly expect. It is probably about the size of Europe. We're not just talking specific countries in Europe, we're talking Europe as a whole. It is absolutely huge. So when it comes to journey times, even between the major cities, they might look like they're close together on the map, but getting between them, if you're using certain modes of transport, can actually take days and not just hours. Therefore, you will need to make sure that you provision for that in your itinerary. In terms of getting around though, then it is possible to rent cars. There are also bus options, rail options, and options on internal flights. And obviously you need to factor in the cost of everything as well as the overall convenience before you choose whichever one suits you the best. In terms of what suited us the best, because we are on a budget, was to go through Greyhound buses. They have what are known as Wimmit passes that provide you access to either the half of Australia that we ended up exploring around, or you can also do a national Wimmit pass, which takes you through the entire Greyhound network all over Australia for a certain period of time. And obviously the price of that pass depends on both of those factors, whether you're doing the whole network or some of the network and also the duration for which you're planning on using that pass. If you wanna have a bit of a better explanation, then we do have a video within our Australia playlist that does fully explain what we've done. So we'll refer to that in the description. Since we did travel by bus, I think it's fair that we offer some information about that service in particular, just know that you're not going to get the same kind of comfort as you would on the buses in Southeast Asia. While these are definitely coach buses, you're not going to be getting a lay flat seat. They're definitely just cushy coach bus seats that do recline a little bit. 
There is typically free Wi-Fi and charging ports at your seat. However, on some of the more remote journeys, you will not have access to Wi-Fi, even if the bus provides it just because it's such a remote location. Also, the buses do typically have a washroom on board. However, they ask that you only use it if it's an emergency situation, as they do take comfort breaks every two to five hours. So they prefer if you use the washroom when you get to one of the rest stops. As mentioned, then certain Greyhound buses do offer Wi-Fi, but honestly, the offering of Wi-Fi is pretty widespread throughout most places in Australia. Whether that's a service station, a restaurant, a cafe, whatever have you, generally speaking, you'll be able to find some decent Wi-Fi hotspot somewhere whenever you're in a city. Some of these are even city-wide, including the likes of Sydney. So with that, then obviously it's always a good idea to make sure that you have at least some data while you are going to countries like Australia. But the good news is you probably won't have to have as big a data package because the Wi-Fi will be on hand for you in most instances. Much to our delight, Australians love a good quality barista-made coffee as part of their brunch culture. And so do we. You might be surprised that gas stations, McDonald's, service centers all offer actually pretty decent quality coffees, unlike what you would find in North America at least. In Australia, we would go so far as to say that the weak link is Starbucks. So try and go for a more independent coffee shop if you can. As for prices, the coffees usually cost about the same as they would in Canada. And our recommendations of what to try in terms of the coffee in Australia are a flat white or a magic, since that is something that they invented there. And if you want more information on a magic, we kind of explained what it is in one of our Melbourne videos. So we'll link to that in the description as well. Not only is the cost of a coffee generally about the same as it would be in Canada and the UK, but pretty much everything to do with food is also about the same kind of price point. So that is definitely worth bearing in mind when you're considering groceries versus going out and eating at a restaurant. The major cities in Australia in particular are major hotspots for migrant workers as well, and with them, they do bring their authentic cuisine, which is always available and obviously very tasty, much in the same way as you might experience in North America and in London. But if you want something that is authentically Australian, then as we've alluded to in the previous point, Australians love their brunch culture. In fact, if I have my facts right, I believe that they were the originators of avocado toast, among other things. So if you really want to get in on a truly authentic Australian experience of eating out, then go for brunch, especially with one of their delicious coffees. Because of the price points and the fact that we are on a budget though, then we didn't go out to eat, opting to go for groceries instead. But perhaps one day, when we're making money off YouTube at long last, then we'll go back and we will enjoy a true Aussie brunch as intended. It's not just food that's about the same price as you would find in North America and Europe, but also wine. Wine costs about the same amount. However, if you're looking to get any beer or spirits, then it turns out that it is actually substantially more than it is in Europe and North America. So another thing to think about when you're planning your trip to Australia. I would hope that this goes without saying, but Australia is known for being a warm country with a lot of sunshine and a lot of beaches. For that, then obviously you're going to need to take some sunscreen with you, but there is a note about the type of sunscreen that you end up having with you when you are in Australia. Due to conservation efforts, particularly surrounding the marine wildlife in Australia, then it is always strongly advised that if you are going to be going on a beach or in any water in Australia, that you should be wearing reef safe sunscreen. If you're going on a tour of the Whitsundays or the Great Barrier Reef, this will be made available by the tour operator for free so you can take advantage of that. However, for general use, then the good news is that you will be able to find reef safe sunscreen at basically any pharmacy in the whole of Australia. But just as a note, make sure that if you are going to lather up with sunscreen, it is reef safe. As any of you who watch our videos will know, we love a good walking tour, especially a good free walking tour. The concept of how they work 
really appeals to us. And while we were in both Sydney and Melbourne, we did walking tours with the company called I'm Free. We highly recommend them as we found them very comprehensive, providing us with not only a lot of history and local recommendations, but also injecting some humor into it as well. So if you want to do the same thing, then they have a website and you can look them up online where you can reserve your spot on a tour. Another really cool thing about Sydney, especially from a tourist perspective, is that a lot of the museums in the city are completely free entry. That's right, no entrance fees whatsoever. You may end up needing to pay a little bit extra for special exhibits that they may have on, but for a general admission ticket, then you pay nothing to get in. So for the more budget conscious of you, then this will be a huge leg up to learn more about Australia. Sydney has a really good public transportation system and it includes buses and trains. The amazing thing is that you can pay for it using your credit or debit card as well as your Apple and Google Pay so you don't need to buy an additional ticket or pass. That being said, in smaller cities like Airlie Beach as well as Cairns, their public transportation system is cash based. Not only is the public transport in Sydney easy to use, but it is also extremely cost effective and also includes their well-renowned ferry service. So the great news with that is that if you wanted to take a tour around the harbour, then rather than going with a relatively expensive tour company, then instead one of the cheapest ways to get this done would be simply to take a ferry from Circular Quay to Manly Beach and back. That way you end up saving at least $30 Australian per person to still go and see the famous Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge from a slightly closer view. In order to see the Whit Sundays, the Great Barrier Reef and Uluru, although Uluru is a little bit of an exception because you can do it independently as well, most likely to see those three, you're going to want to go on a tour. And from our research, all of the tour operators offered very similar packages and hovered around the same price. I believe we generally opted to go with the tour operator that offered the cheapest price. And we had a brilliant time on all three of the tours that we went on. So I think it's just worth doing a little bit of research, ensuring that the package you're choosing offers what you want, although I don't think there's much difference between what the companies offer and weighing up what the package includes versus the price. In terms of the tours of the Whit Sundays and Great Barrier Reef, the only differences in price really seem to be whether you were going to be opting into scuba diving or sticking with just snorkeling. Obviously scuba diving increase the price of the tour. So it just depends on what you want to do. One of the major sites that we got to explore through is the Outback, which is a absolutely humongous desert right slap bang in the middle of Australia. It is gorgeous, but because of the inhospitable conditions, owing to the fact that it is a desert, then there really isn't much by way of human settlements as you are going through the Outback. The same cannot quite be said though for the likes of Alice Springs. Alice Springs is actually a decent sized settlement slap bang in the middle of the country. And actually with that comes pretty much all of the same kinds of amenities that you can expect from other Australian cities dotted around the country. The same cannot be said for any of the other little townships and settlements that you end up exploring along the rest of the outback routes. Generally speaking, the most that you'll expect to see will be maybe a few little houses, a gas station, which also folds out into a convenience store, and that's kind of your lot. There's really not much else. So if you are planning on going through the outback, then it's probably best to make sure, especially from an accommodation perspective, that you're using Alice Springs as your launch pad. Therefore, I would hope it would go without saying that if you are driving through the Outback in a camper van or things like that, then you really need to make sure that you are fully stocked up on everything you need prior to you driving through it because the opportunities to restock will be very few and far between. If you're using Alice Springs as a means of going on to the likes of Uluru, then if you look on the map as the crow flies, then it's really not that far away. However, as with the rest of Australia, appearances can be deceiving, and it actually turns out that that national park is about five to six hours driving from Alice Springs. Therefore, if you are planning on taking a day trip to get there, 
then just make sure that that's factored in because you're going to be in for a really, really long day. We ended up doing a tour where it started for us at about six o'clock in the morning and we weren't back at our accommodation until about 1.30 the next morning. So if you are going to do Uluru from Alice Spring, just be prepared for a very long day. The Great Ocean Road is one of the most beautiful scenic drives that you could ever do and it runs between Port Ferry and Melbourne. There are numerous stops that you can make along the way from viewpoints, beaches, hikes, waterfalls to animal spotting. And if you want an idea of where you could stop, just watch our video on the Great Ocean Road that we will link to in the description below. We had limited time to do this in, so we did this over the course of two days, which is a little rushed because we didn't actually get to spend time at the beach or in any of the charming little towns along the way. You could also do this drive in one day if you are really limited on time and were very selective with where you stopped or didn't stop at all and just kind of enjoyed the coast as you drove along the road. However, we know of many people who take five days to do this road so they can really enjoy it to its fullest. The nice thing is when you arrive to any of the viewpoints or beaches, parking is free. So this generally is actually a really good budget-friendly tourist attraction in Australia. When it does come to spotting wildlife though, then you'll find it maybe a little bit easier than you think if you look in the right places. In our experience, if you really wanna see the cute cuddly things such as wallabies, koalas, and kangaroos, then we have some really good spots for you that you can take full advantage of. When we were in Port Ferry, then there is a reserve all of about a five to 10 minute drive away, which is home to a bunch of wild wallabies, which you can obviously appreciate from afar. We do not recommend by any stretch of the imagination going too close because they may feel threatened. In terms of koalas, there are a number of spots along the Great Ocean Road where you can see them. It is definitely a good idea to research exactly what a eucalyptus tree looks like because that is exactly where they will be. And generally any spot along the road that is going through a rainforest will mean that you end up having a chance to spot koalas. The only thing is that they are less than a meter tall and they generally live in some of the tallest spots in eucalyptus trees and eucalyptus trees are quite tall themselves. So spotting them may actually be a bit more of an exact science than you may think. With that, we recommend if you are in somewhere where you know that you may be spotting them, just go slowly because the next thing you know, you'll see something which is about the shape of a football, but it's gray and furry and you'll realize it's a koala. And obviously you don't want to miss that opportunity to then go and spend some more time admiring them from below. If you want a slightly easier time spotting them though, then honestly, the great news is you're not going to be alone in trying to find these cute and cuddly creatures. If you see a bunch of cars that have been parked by the side of the road and a lot of them are outside of their vehicles, then that's usually a good indicator that they've spotted something really cute and cuddly that you want to take a photo of. So that could be another way that you get to see koalas among other animals. As for kangaroos, then shockingly enough, one of the best places that we found to see them wasn't in a forest at all. It was actually towards the end of the Great Ocean Road at Anglesey Golf Club. The reason that we say this is because this golf club actually is technically at the end of a hundreds of kilometers long forest and the kangaroos due to the safe conditions that a golf course provides free of any predators they've chosen it as a really good spot to settle down and so with that you can see hundreds of eastern great kangaroos living their best lives on this golf course while seeing the wallabies and koalas in the spots that we've mentioned is free the golf course does charge you $15 per person for a half hour tour where you get to see the largest mobs of them. However, obviously, since it is probably one of the best opportunities to see them and it is practically guaranteed that you will, then we would say it is 100% worth the money. 
Unlike in Sydney, in Melbourne, you have to buy a travel card to use their public transportation system. Single trips are $5.30 Australian, but daily usage is capped at $10.60 Australian. In our experience, we didn't find the frequency of trains to be that great. We often had to wait about 10 minutes for the train we wanted to show up. So that's just something to bear in mind when you're planning how long it's gonna take you to get from point A to point B. The good news is though that the metro system in Melbourne is absolutely extensive and especially when you are in the CBD, that has nothing to do with weed, trust me, it means downtown. When you're in the centre of Melbourne then actually there is what they call the free tram zone which is literally exactly as it sounds. You get to explore any part of that area via the tram for absolutely nothing. So while that part of Melbourne is very walkable, we have to say if you want a little bit of an additional help getting from point A to point B in that free tram zone, then that can be a good way to save some money as well. The only way to get to Melbourne Airport via public transportation is called the Skybus and it costs 28 Australian dollars per person. Among many things that took our breath away while we were in Australia, one of them was just driving around Tasmania. And so if you do have the time and the money to be able to go, then we highly, highly recommend that you do. However, it is worth noting that when you are in Tasmania, then there is very little by way of public transport options outside of its main city of Hobart. Therefore, it is incredibly likely that you are going to have to rent a car if you want to explore the island. Obviously, when you're planning a journey and you're needing to navigate around, then Google Maps is going to be your best friend, especially when you're driving around Tasmania. However, Google Maps calculates its routes and its journey times based on the maximum speed limit at which you can go. However, as you drive around Tasmania, then you'll start to notice that there are a lot of things like dirt roads and mountain passes, through which you're definitely not going to want to hit the 100 km an hour speed limit. So with that, then for any route suggestion that has a specified ETA, take that with a pinch of salt and probably tack on an extra 20% of however long that's gonna be onto your overall journey time because you are going to get there later than Google Maps says you will. While we're on the subject of dirt roads, just know that there are quite a few in Tasmania and Google Maps will often direct you onto them because they think it's the fastest route. And also because Tasmania isn't that populated, a lot of the roads just are not paved. And this isn't a problem, but it's something to note, especially if you have a rental car or a camper van, because you don't wanna be charged for any damage that going over potholes or flying stones and rocks could cause your vehicle. Therefore, it's just safest to avoid them if you can, which not possible, or just slow down and take your time. Port Arthur is a very popular tourist attraction in Tasmania and the general admission tickets that you buy to Port Arthur are actually valid for 48 hours, which means that you can spend two days exploring this historic site. One of the main reasons that you're going to want to explore Tasmania is for its natural beauty. However, what we didn't quite realize is that a lot of the best spots that you're going to want to check out are actually within Tasmania's national park system and the national parks themselves often incur a fee in order for you to go exploring around them. Therefore, if you are on a budget, then you definitely need to make sure that you are provisioning for the cost of these national parks before you go. So it's really worth doing your research, not least because the cost to enter each of these parks will be different between each one. Speaking of national parks, one of the ones that you're likely going to want to see is the one that contains the famous Cradle Mountain. Just bear in mind that to access any of the trails in this national park, you're going to need to take a shuttle bus to get there because the distance between the visitor center and any of the trailheads is quite vast and you're likely not going to want to spend the time walking it. The shuttle bus is an additional cost, kind of. And the reason I say this is because when you go to the national parks, if this is not your first one, you may be tempted to buy a pass that includes entrance to all of the national parks. And of course, depending on how many of you're going to, it might be the best value for money. For us, however, because we only visited two national parks, 
it didn't work out that way because if you have the pass that allows you entrance to all the national parks, then the shuttle bus is an additional fee. However, if you just purchase one pass for one national park, and then you go to the national park in which Cradle Mountain sits, the price of entrance into Cradle Park National Pass includes the shuttle bus. So it could be a little bit of complicated math that you have to do, depending on how many national parks you're planning on visiting, to see if it's worth buying a pass that includes all of them or buying individual tickets when you also factor in that the shuttle bus could be an additional cost. We do want to just warn you about another part of driving in Australia though. If you happen to find yourself driving at night, then you'll notice a couple of things. The first is that outside of the cities, there really aren't many street lamps that are guiding your way. And the other thing is that there really aren't many other vehicles on the road. And that is generally with a good reason. The wildlife in Australia is generally nocturnal. So therefore between dawn and dusk, then they are going to be at their most active. The way that that causes a problem is that a lot of the wildlife is also just not road aware in any way, shape or form. So it is quite possible that if you find yourself driving at night on an open road, you may end up encountering the likes of kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, whatever have you, and it's possible that you may end up just hitting them. Therefore, if you want to avoid any such complications to your journeys through Australia, then it is 100% worth just making sure that if you're going to drive at all, you're doing so during daylight hours. And that's our list for Australia. We hope that you have found our tips and tricks helpful and that you can apply them to any of your future travels. We do realize that this is not an exhaustive list, so if you have any questions or further recommendations, please leave a comment below. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.